Great job, everyone. Well, next Sunday is going to be a very, very special day for your church. I mean, some of you have been down this road before, so you know what it's like. Others of you, this may be a new experience for you. But um, it's going to be a, a very special day for you. You have the privilege of selecting your next pastor, uh, the one who's going to be shepherding you for hopefully years to come. Um, I know very little about Alex. Um, um, I'm not on the credentialing committee any longer, so I was not a part of that meeting on Tuesday. But everything I have heard is that this is an exceptional young man. Young man. And don't be fearful of that, okay? I'm, I'm glad back when I started ministry that, that maybe there were some people who were afraid of that or fearful of that, but I'm glad that, that you know, they got over it and I got over it and everybody's got to start somewhere. Um, and, and Alex being young, there are so many advantages that come with, with a young age. You'll have the privilege as a congregation to... Uh, to mature and grow with him, um, you'll be able to grow together. And I'm truly excited for you and, and believe that your best days, individually and collectively, are before you. I remember the first time I preached, I think I mentioned this to you some time back, I was 17. I have no idea what the occasion was. Uh, I was a senior in high school. That, that, that message that I preached was very short, really sort of cemented my call to ministry. Um, I, I'm sure that, that if the people who heard me back then were alive today, and I'm sure most of them are not, um, they probably didn't remember a thing that I said. I can't remember what I, much of what I said. But uh, there was a stirring that went on in my heart and that stirring continued until you know here I am many years later having spent a whole lot of years in ministry um, but I remember that I remember how anxious I was and I remember how how I would I, I, you know, I rehearsed that message over and over and over again um, I, I was that, that, that reminds me of a story that I want to lead into because it's a story that leads into our, our subject today. There was a young guy who was preaching in his church, uh, first church that, that he'd ever pastored, and preaching his first sermon, and his topic on this particular occasion was Revelation 22.20, where it's the, the passage about how Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. What the ladies sang about, uh, just uh, what we all sang about, just a little bit uh, earlier this, 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 uh, this morning. And as he was reading his text, he ran to the edge of the platform and he said, Behold, I come quickly. But he forgot what he was supposed to say next. So, you know, he just backed up and he ran toward the edge of the platform again and, and, and he said, Behold, I come quickly. But again, he had a, you know, a, just a mental block and didn't know what he was supposed to say next. So he did what he... What he had done before, he backed up and for a third time he runs to the edge of the platform with all this, this vim and, and this vigor and, and, and he says the same thing he said the previous two times, behold I come quickly. But this time he caught his foot on a cord on the platform and he literally launched off of the platform onto the front pew right into the lap of an old deacon who was sitting there. And uh, of course that young pastor is just... I mean, he's, 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 he's so embarrassed, he's humiliated. He said, oh, sir, I, I am so sorry. And the surprised deacon, as you might expect, uh, said, oh, son, don't worry about it. You warned me three times that you were coming. <laughs> and I, 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 I share that with you because guess what? Jesus has told us more than three times that he is coming. And it's important for us to not be surprised like that deacon was when the pastor landed in his lap. Um, did you know that every book of the Bible makes reference to the second coming of Jesus, except for two, which are personal letters, the book of Philemon and the book of Third John? 
All the other books, 64 of the 66 books, makes reference to Jesus coming back. I, I think because the Lord repeats himself over and over again, literally over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, it'd be wise for people to sit up and take notice to what the Lord is saying. Here's the punctuation. Here's the big idea for this morning's message, and I'm going to wrap some thoughts around this. Some people think that Christians are out of their mind, you know, to believe this stuff about Jesus coming back. Um, but yet there's a day coming that this, that, that this great event's going to happen. Uh, and it's going to be like no other event that has ever occurred in all of human history. Suddenly, millions of dead Christians are going to come up out of the graves and, and, the, and living believers are, are going to be caught up to meet the Lord and he's going to take us to our eternal home, to heaven. The Apostle Paul believed in the second coming of Jesus and he taught that. We, we've, we've looked at a passage of scripture now for several weeks. Uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I want you to follow along one more time as I read this to you. Um, I'm going to read it from an expanded translation, from the Greek translation. This is how it, how it reads. Beginning at verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writes, Now, we do not wish you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who from time to time are falling asleep, in order that you may not be mourning in the same manner as the rest who do not have hope. For in view of the fact that we believe that Jesus died and arose, thus also will God bring with him those who have fallen asleep through the intermediate agency of Jesus. For this we are saying to you by the Lord's word, that, that as for us who are living and are left behind until the coming of the Lord, we shall by no means precede those who fell asleep. Because the Lord himself with a cry of command, with the archangel's voice, and with a call of the trumpet sounded by at God's command shall descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then as for us who are living and who are left behind, together with them we shall be snatched away forcibly in clouds for a welcome meeting with the Lord in the lower atmosphere, and thus always shall be shall we be with the Lord, so that be encouraging one another with these words. We all know that when Jesus um, came out of the grave that he was on earth for another 40 days. And during that time, he, uh, he, had, he, had, um, um, he had encounters with a, a number of different people, in fact, about 500 people. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that there were these two angels that were standing there watching as Jesus on this 40th day is, uh, is ascending to heaven. And these angels are watching these believers. And you would have to understand that they knew this was the last time they were going to see Jesus. In fact, they, they probably didn't think they would ever see him after Good Friday. But he came back from the dead. And he's with them for 40 days. And, and, and now he is, he is being taken back into heaven. And these angels simply say to them, why are you looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. With that being said, I, I want us to look this morning at three interesting truths about the second coming of Jesus. I probably won't share anything with you this morning that you haven't heard some other radio preacher, television preacher, or maybe a pastor share with you. But three, three I think, interesting truths about the second coming of Jesus. And I'll use First Thessalonians chapter 4 along with an assortment of other verses as well. You've got a note sheet you can Fill in a few blanks if you choose to do so. Here, here's the, the first interesting truth about the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Christ is not just one event, but one of a number of events. Now, most of us don't think that way, but that's what the Bible says. 
the, the, the study of end times is called eschatology. Uh, it's a big word, it, it, but basically it means it's a part of theology that is connected specifically with death, with judgment, and with the final destiny of, of, of the souls of humankind. I, I, I brought with me two books from my, from my study, not to be impressed, not for that reason, but to, to, to have you look at how extensive this subject is. We're not talking about uh, something you can, you can understand or you can, you can read about in a few pages, but literally hundreds of pages, because this is a major topic that we find in Scripture. And again, as I mentioned earlier, so many of the books of the Bible speak about the second coming of Jesus. Let me, as I mentioned there, that, that the second coming is not just one event, but a number of events. Here's the first event, the rapture. It could happen at any moment. Uh, you know, nothing keeps Jesus from coming back except the Father's command. Uh, there, there's nothing that has to happen. Uh, I know that through the years there have been those who have talked about all of the, all the check marks that have to be in place before Jesus can come back. And at one time that may have been true, but that's not true anymore. He could come back at any moment. There's nothing that keeps him from coming back except, again, his Father's command. And that I believe that the next great event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. I think if you and I could go into the Lord's office, his study, and could look at his calendar, and we look at that prophetic calendar, that's what we would find. The next event is going to be his son returning to this earth. The last recorded words of Jesus are found in Revelation 20 to 20. And it's the words that, that I mentioned this young preacher said three different times. Surely I come quickly, I come soon. Now, we use the word rapture, but that word does not, cannot be found in the Bible. Do you know that? You cannot go to your concordance and find out what book and chapter and verse that particular word is found. It's not found in the Bible. Um, so why do we use the word? Well, you know, why do we address the return of Jesus saying it's the rapture? Well, for many years, the only Bible that translation that there was was called the Latin Vulgate. And in the Latin, the word raptio is the word from which we get our English word rapture. Um, but it's not found in the Bible. That may be a difference. You can call it whatever you want. I don't think it really makes much difference what the word is, as long as we understand that there's coming a time when Jesus is coming back for his church. First Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, we, we read about Paul writing to these young believers and instructing them because they're concerned about what has happened to those who have died and Jesus hasn't come back yet because their understanding was only those who were living would go to, to heaven when, when, you know, when Jesus comes back. And those who died would not make it to heaven. And so he writes this letter partly to, to clear up that misunderstanding. And he says here in this passage I read to you, and that has been read for several weeks now, that, that, that when the Lord comes back, he's going to catch up. He's going to literally catch up. He's going to snatch away forcibly. That's, by the way, the, the literal Greek translation. Snatch away forcibly. It's the Greek word I think you have it in your notes. It's called, the, it's, it's called harpazo. So rather than, you know, rather than us saying caught away or, or snatched away forcibly, we talk about the rapture, how Jesus is going to come back for the church, for the believers. But again, I don't think it matters what word you use. As long as you understand Jesus is coming back for every past and present believer, those who are dead and those who are alive. And so that's, that's, the, that's the first that's the first eschatological event mentioned in Scripture. But the second one's this. According to Daniel chapter 9, um, the Antichrist will rule for seven years. Now, we're not going to get into all of that this morning. 
Uh, if we were going on and doing a study in, in 2 Thessalonians, we would talk about the Antichrist because Paul specifically talks about the Antichrist in that, in that particular letter. But after Jesus you know, snatches away forcibly the church, there's going to be this political leader who's going to, be, who's going to rise up, this global leader. And at first he's going to be looked upon as like a great peacemaker, maybe the greatest ever like some great president or some head of state. And, and the world will want someone like that because the world is going to be in such chaos. Because all the believers are going to be gone. Can you imagine what that's going to look like? What, that's going to, what the world's going to be like when all the believers suddenly are gone? But Scripture goes on and talks about how this, this Antichrist, his true demonic nature is going to be revealed during this time of great peril, during this time called the tribulation. Jesus spoke about this in Matthew chapters 24, 25, 26, what is oftentimes referred to as the Olivet Discourse. There's going to be this time when there's going to be this seven-year reign rule that's going to happen in the world. It's going to be divided into two parts. There's the tribulation, the first three and a half years, then there's the great tribulation in the last three and a half years. Read the middle section of the book of Revelation. You'll get a glimpse of what this great tribulation time is going to be like. Um, it's going to be, from what Scripture says, the, the worst thing the world has ever gone through. And now, right now, that promise obviously is unfulfilled. And, and it may even, I think, in, in some people's minds, be totally unrealistic. But the Bible says someday it's going to happen. Now, again, if we were to continue our study into 2 Thessalonians, we would read more about the Antichrist, and you can read about him there. Uh, for instance, in chapter 2, verse 4, 2 Thessalonians. But one thing that Paul says about this leader, he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Again, that will be a... It'll be a, a time in human history that has that will be like none that's ever been experienced before. That's the second event. A third one that I will mention is when Jesus returns, he will, he will then win the final battle. The Bible says there's coming a final battle. We call it the, the Battle of Armageddon. Now, many people are confused about the second coming of Jesus because, because the Bible talks about all of these events that are going to happen in the future. And sometimes they, it's easy to blend them, or at least it look like they are blended together. For instance, you have uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we may get to that, um, maybe in our next lesson, I'm not sure. But it, it, it says there that, that Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night which obviously speaks about suddenness, about secretiveness. And then you go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, and, and it speaks about how Jesus is coming in glory, and, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. So the question is, what is it? Is it the secret thing, or is it going to be something that everybody has the, 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 you know, will be able to see? Well, I, the answer is not either or, but both and. Because when Jesus comes suddenly in the rapture, he comes in the clouds. That's what Acts 1.11 says. And we, you know, we, uh, the dead and the living saints, are caught up to be with him. And he escorts, escorts us to heaven. But then you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the passage that we're in right now. And, and, and Jesus talks about that. He explains how that's going to happen. But then scripture says that seven years later, after Jesus comes back and takes the church home at the end of the Great Tribulation, that, that, that Jesus is going to return. In fact, he's going to return with all of, all of us are going to come back with him. And, and, and the Antichrist is going to be defeated for a, for a final time. And those of us who, who either are dead or living uh, are going to come back with Jesus. We're going to be part of that, that army that he has but it's going to be the shortest battle in all of the world. Because, in fact, we don't even fight. Revelation 19 explains it. Jesus will just speak the word. 
and the, the Antichrist uh, will be destroyed. And that coincides exactly with what the Apostle Paul wrote about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Now, there are other events we could talk about, but that, those are just three that I mentioned to you. Here, here's the second interesting truth about the second coming of Jesus. Without any warning, Jesus will return. Now, this is something that all of you are familiar with. I, I'm sure you've heard every preacher talk about this, uh, about the, the fact that he's going to come back, and, and we don't know when he's going to come back, so we've got to be ready. And that's exactly true. See, his coming is indeed the best kept secret in all of the world, in all of heaven. And in fact, when, when Jesus was on earth, Jesus did not even know when he was going to come back. Um, and, and, but I, now that I believe that he's in heaven, I believe that he does know when he's going to come back. Um, Matthew 24, I mentioned that earlier. Jesus said that, that, that no person, no one, no one knows the day, the hour of his return. So obviously whenever you hear somebody set a date, and that has been done down through the centuries, just as recently as, as the 1980s, uh, when Jesus is going to come back, and probably even some dates even after that that I've not been aware of. But people have set dates. They, they've done this regularly. But, but, and Jesus said, it's, it's foolish because nobody knows. But Jesus did say, you could look for the season of his return. That's what you find in, in Matthew 24, 25, 26. He spoke about the fig tree that is blossoming or budding, a clear sign of the return of Christ, that, that, that his, his return is very near. Uh, the, 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 the fig tree, obviously, is a, is a representative of the nation of Israel. You know, for 1,900 years, there was no nation of Israel until, until just May 14, 1948, when Israel literally became a nation all over again. And God is right now gathering Jewish people back to that homeland, that, that land that he promised to Abraham and his descendants. And this is something, in my opinion, that just cannot be ignored. But remember that as a Christian, we don't look for signs. Um, according to, you know, to Paul's words here in, in verse 16, we listen for sounds. It's not signs. It's sounds. And he said that there would be three sounds that would, that would announce the return of Jesus. The first was a loud command from the Lord. I, I don't know what he's going to say. I have no idea what that command will be. Maybe it'd be like when he was standing outside the tomb of Lazarus. And he cupped his hands to his, face, to his mouth and he, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Maybe something like that. I don't know. But just imagine you hearing your name being spoken. Won't that be something? Um, as he calls people either, either out of the grave or, or those who are living to gather with him, there's going to be a loud command. And, and Paul also talks about how there's going to be a voice of the archangel. Now there's just one archangel mentioned in the Bible. And that's, and that's, that's uh, Michael. Uh, we do have the name of Gabriel, but Gabriel is not considered, a, an, he's not an archangel. The only one is Michael. I don't know what Michael's responsibilities are in heaven right now. Maybe he's, a, he's kind of in charge of all the angels. I, I don't know. Man, and maybe his job is going to be to uh, assemble all the angels for the events that are going to happen at the end of time. Because again, when you read the book of Revelation, you read that center section of Revelation, you see how active the angels are in the judgments that, that are poured out upon the earth of those who are left behind. And we may not know all the ways in which the angels will be involved in Jesus' return um, and the events that follow, but something we do know is that the angelic hosts will share in this victory shout when he returns. And then a, a third sound that Paul mentions, of course, is the trumpet call of God. 
Now again, what, what does that mean? And when I go back to the Old Testament, I know how important trumpets were for the nation of Israel. I think they're first introduced to us in the book of Numbers. But you find them all through the historical books. The blowing of the trumpets. In fact, in Numbers 10.10, 10, the, Lord, the Lord said, When you go to war in your land, of course, they're still wandering around, but when they finally get into the promised land, you shall blow an alarm with the trumpet. In the, in the Roman Empire, uh, trumpets were used to announce when a, a very important person had finally arrived, such as the emperor. What, you know, what greater entrance could there possibly be uh, than Jesus coming in, coming back. Maybe that's part of it, I don't know. But I know, I, I know that in verse 16, Paul talks about this, this, this commander's call of the king. He talks about the voice of the archangel calling the other angels. The trumpet of God, which awakens the dead and summons the, 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 the living believers. I think it's most important to understand that this event of Jesus' return will happen quickly, suddenly. You know, there'll be no time for any person to come to church you know, and, and kneel at an altar and pray. There'll, there'll be no time to pick up the phone and you know, call your pastor, call a favorite person of yours, um, a trusted friend. The Bible says that this gathering that's going to happen in the clouds is going to happen suddenly. Paul uses the phrase, the twinkling of an eye. You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says this, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, that's verse 16, 1 Thessalonians 4, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will will be changed. The, 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 the Greek translation says it this way, in an instant of time, so small it cannot be divided into smaller units. That's the literal Greek translation of that. That's how, you know, that's fast, folks. That, I, you know, that, that's faster than fast. And when Jesus comes back, it's going to happen real, real quickly. You know, last Sunday I talked to you about a zeptosecond. Uh, that's a trillionth of a billionth of a second. Uh, that, I think that's fairly quick, too. You know, that really is like how quickly you can look across the room. Twinkling of an eye. The, the twinkling of an eye is not the same as the blink of the eye, by the way. Uh, if, if you're really fast, you can blink your eye in about one four hundredth of a second. But a true twinkling of an eye is faster than that. Um, pastor and author, Warren Wiersbe, I've mentioned him before, says this. He says, he is either going to come with us or for us. I guess the point I'm trying to make is simply this. We have to be prepared because his, his coming is going to happen so quickly, you cannot wait to get right with the Lord. I cannot emphasize that enough. Here's a, a third interesting truth about the second coming. The second coming of Jesus will have an impact around the world regarding those who are left behind. Just let, let your mind wander for just a moment. What do you think the world's going to look like the day after Jesus returns in the clouds? I can only imagine. Yeah, I, I got, I've got a fairly good imagination. I don't think I, I can even imagine what it's going to look like. I can, I can even capture that moment. The rapture of the church will be, without any challenge, the most historic event in all of human history. This is what Jesus said, Matthew 24, verse 39 through 42. That is how it will be at the coming of the, of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. And then he says this, verse 42, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Let me describe 
maybe what, what, what this might look like for someone who is not a believer. It's just a, just a, 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 a hypothesis. I imagine for a moment, you know, there's an elderly gentleman sitting, um, you know, sitting in the stands at a, an afternoon Detroit Tigers Cleveland Indians ball game. And the batter hits a ball out to center field, and it's a, just a routine fly ball. But suddenly the ball just hits the grass. There's no one there to catch it. Or, or, or think about somebody, think about a truck driver who's, who's driving a, an 18-wheeler, you know, west on M60. And, and suddenly, without warning, darts off the highway and ends up in the parking lot of the Crossroads Missionary Church. Why? Or there's, a, you know, there's an American Airlines flight from Miami to O'Hare that is making its final approach and suddenly this drops out of the sky. Why? Because in each scenario, the center fielder, the semi-truck driver, the pilot, the co-pilot have been raptured. And I think following the rapture, there will be first responders with emergency vehicles answering 9-11 calls everywhere. Imagine the level of global disaster that will occur. I mean, cataclysmic events of every type in every country will be happening. I believe there will be people in the streets hysterical because suddenly their children are gone and they don't know what's happened to them. There will be nations with no leaders. And this will be, again, the perfect opportunity for a likable world leader, an antichrist, to step forward, you know, to, to somehow convince this, this feverish worldwide population of the advantage of a one-world government and a one-world economy. And my guess is that those who are left behind won't even notice the, 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 the dead Christians who have been called out of the graves. But I believe they will certainly notice every living believer who suddenly has vanished. See, I, I, I believe that on the day of the rapture, you know, whether that happens on a, a Sunday or a, a Tuesday or a, a Friday, every church in America, maybe the entire world, will be packed with people who will suspect what has happened and realize they've been left behind. And unfortunately, there will be those who, who will confess that they knew Jesus by name, but they never knew Jesus in their heart. And they too will be left behind. So my question is this, are you rapture ready? I think the most important decision you can make is to give your heart to Jesus. You know, if for no other reason, maybe selfishly, you simply don't want to be left behind. Now, unfortunately, there will be, you know, there will be those who, who will be left behind. Just remember this. There's a deadline over which you have no control. And that deadline is the sudden and unannounced return of Jesus. Did, did you know that, that newspapers, newspapers have a special font they use for, for really, really special events? Uh, like, like, for instance, uh, the bombing of, per, of, of Pearl Harbor, um, December 7, 1941, or the assassination of, of President Kennedy in 62. Um, the, the events of 9-11, uh, the, the bombings in New York City and Pennsylvania and, and the Pentagon. Um, the most recent time was, was May 2nd, 2011, to announce the death of Osama bin Laden. This is what the font looks like. See that? That's a pretty good sized font, isn't it? That is probably actually maybe a little bit larger than that. That's the headline of the newspaper. Uh, and they only use that they only use that for, for special events. It's not called breaking news font, or it's not called can you believe it font. It's called second coming font. Isn't that interesting? For a specific reason. Now, maybe they don't understand this totally, but there's no greater event that will ever occur in all of the world 
from creation uh, until, the, the, until the very end, like the return of Jesus Christ. Here's the takeaway. I think since it is, it is, it's a biblical fact that Jesus is coming again, let us determine that we will live today and all the days to come in such a way so we're ready to face him with great confidence. Let me close with this illustration. You've heard me, you've heard me mention uh, Vance Havner, pastor, author. Tells the story of a woman who was waiting at a train station for her fiancé, who was soon to arrive for their wedding. And she was looking and waiting. And there was also an old schoolmaster who was waiting in the station, but he was waiting for a different reason. You know, he, he had a train schedule, and his job was to keep the train on schedule. Nothing more, nothing less. He was not anticipating the arrival of the train the same way that the bride-to-be was looking forward to that train arriving. Then, de- then Dr. Habner concluded the story by simply saying this, May God give us the spirit of that bride rather than the spirit of the station master. I would suggest to you that there are plenty of people in churches this morning, maybe some here, who are like that station master and not like that bride-to-be. May we be, be anxiously waiting and watching for the return of Jesus. So please hear me out. You may think you know all the facts about Jesus' is coming again. Even if that were true, let me tell you this, knowing the facts does not make you ready. Jesus' last words, Revelation 22:20, 20, yes, I am coming soon. And then the apostle John's reply to that was, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So I say to you, is that your prayer? Are you truly rapture ready? We're not going to sing a song this morning. I'm going to ask that we just have a time of quietness. And perhaps in the the quietness of where you sit, you you need to talk to the Lord about something. I don't know what that might be. I would encourage you to do that. To speak to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Tell him what's on your heart. And, um, and understand that, that he loves you and cares for you more than you can imagine. And he most of all wants you in heaven someday. Let's pray. Lord, as you speak to our hearts, may we be quick to say yes and to do, Lord, what it is that you're asking us to do. Because we know, Lord, that you would never ask us to do something that would not be for our benefit, that would not help us. Lord, we want to live our lives in a way that pleases you and honors you. And Lord, if you should come back this afternoon or tomorrow morning or or sometime this next month, we just want to be ready. So Lord, you've said, I'm coming. Help us to have the response of John. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Bless us now, Lord, as we leave. Dismiss us with your goodness and your love. In the name of Christ, amen, amen. You are dismissed.